As you may know, hi everyone, my name is Asma Chaudhry. Thank you for joining us again for the Washington Sculptors Group Conversation, Audiences for Art. So thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, of course, a little bit of housekeeping for everyone. We would appreciate it if you can keep your cameras on if you like to. Um, if you close out, no problem. It just helps the bandwidth uh, for the connection. But one important thing is to keep your uh, mic muted. Um, and I had that a second ago. So it helps just for um, sound quality for everyone. And so we can hear our panelists pretty clearly, okay? All right, so this program, as you know, is a third in a series for WSG members and other artists in our community on professional skills development. And if you had joined us in previous conversations we've had, we've had writing your artist statement and how to develop your elevator speech. So tonight we have approaching a gallery, which I'm really excited about with some good friends that we have. And in the future, we're going to have speaking with curators or collectors, and then beyond that, finding opportunities and networking. So a lot of great programming coming up and which leads me to the wonderful member benefits that you have for you know, partaking in and participating as a member of Washington Sculptors Group. So as you look forward to 2021, because I think we're all done with 2020, right? We're getting there. Um, please make sure to join or renew your membership. Um, take advantage of this great programming that we're offering to you and the community. And we've got live exhibitions too. So another wonderful thing to look forward to. In addition, um, please make sure you add and update your work on our WSG member gallery. Um, we've got great you know, pieces of artwork out there, artist statements, and you can include your social media and websites. And of course, you know, take a look at home. You're gonna have um, coming up in your mailbox, um, in addition, the, the most recent edition of the Washington Sculptor. So a lot of great articles in there to stay up to date and, and a collector's item, honestly, right? And of course, social networking opportunities. So keep an eye out for the Facebook pages. We've been doing a lot with Artina 2020. Um, so make sure we're going Facebook Live. We're doing a lot of new things and really expanding our aperture with the community. So tonight, we have a very full program, and we will go directly to content, okay? <laughs> so we plan to stay online for a few minutes afterwards. Um, this worked really well last time with sort of an after party, um, and we'll just, you know, kind of chat and reintroduce ourselves. Anything that's on your mind, feel free to stick around, um, and we'll go from there, okay? So let me take a second to introduce our two program folks. They like to call themselves. I call them coordinators, Eric Salarier and Joan Weber. So Joan, if you want to wave, wave, there you go, there's Joan. Okay, so Joan is and was on the WSG Board of Directors and for many years as a liaison to the advisory board. And she's back and we're glad to have her. Um, she is a business person after teaching 11 years at the university level. Uh, she built her own um, printing machinery export business with her aunt. And for 23 years, she was a sales VP in a large printing company here in the DC area. And for the past 15 years, she's been working in commercial real estate. So we're really excited to have Joan back. And then Eric Salarier, uh, who lives and works in the DC metro area. You know him uh, with a BA from the University of Maryland and an MFA from the University of Cincinnati. Um, you know, he's an artist, educator, reviewer, curator, and just all around good person that we have on the board, okay? Uh, he describes the central theme of his work as biological evolution associated with human impact. That's pretty deep stuff here. <laughs> Much of his work can be seen as designing opportunities to allow audiences to construct personally meaningful understandings of our world. All right. And lastly, you know me, Asma Chaudhry. I'm a sculptor, educator, and board member uh, helping out with social media. So that's kind of my shtick that I really enjoy and happy to you know, support and uh, share about your work, okay? So once again, it's my pleasure to be hosting these sessions and on tonight's Audiences for Art Approaching a Gallery. There are lots of questions and misunderstandings about galleries that we never get to ask or clear up. Tonight, we will be able to ask two of the leading gallerists in town some of the questions we've always wanted to ask, but have not. So now let's turn it over to Joan and Eric. The floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm, I am looking forward to this conversation as much as you probably are, because in our brief pre-production conversations, I, I can speak for myself, Eric and I learned an awful lot that was new to us about the gallery business, 
which is now actually what I'm going to be calling commercial art spaces. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that. But we want to start just quickly with an overview of the two galleries and gallerists that we are our, our panelists tonight to learn a little bit then about the business of galleries and the ways in which business is run may affect that, that, that came to us uh, from members, from, from the audience basically. And we're going to be um, looking at those questions and spending time with that. So I'd like to introduce our first panelist and, and that would be Romy Silverstein. Romy, do you want to, can you wave? I, I, don't, I don't see a view, so I'm assuming Romy is waving. Uh, Romy is the gallery director at Addison Ripley Fine Art, which has been serving the DC and national arts community since 1981. She has a master's degree in museum studies from George Washington University. And she focuses on, I'm going to emphasize some of the words here, curatorial services for both public and private spaces, as well as exhibition design and collections management in and out of the gallery setting. She acts as a liaison between artists and collectors and consultants, as well as fostering new and continuing relationships as both artists and collections continue to evolve. Romy, would you, be, would you tell us a little bit about the gallery, about Addison Ripley? Sure. So um, Addison Ripley, as you said, was established in 1981, coming up on a, a big anniversary next year by Christopher Addison and Sylvia Ripley. And Christopher at the time was working in exhibition and design at the Smithsonian and specifically chief of design at the Renwick. And the gallery really came to be because they had so many artists, friends, friends who they thought were really wonderful artists that DC just wasn't providing the opportunities that they felt they deserved. I think we all sort of know, especially then we were New York, Philadelphia, other cities um, were doing things and they just felt like DC needed, if, you know, that was something they wanted to do to contribute to the arts community. But that has since grown widely. <laughs> and um, we've grown from our space behind the Phillips Collection and Cosmo Club, which is now International Arts and Artists, to our Georgetown location. And we represent a wide range of artists in different media, painting, photography. We do have some sculptors, of course, printmaking, drawing. We, we really try to continue to mix it up to keep it exciting for our artists, our clients, ourselves. Um, and just to serve the arts community in that way. And I've been there for um, quite a while, roughly 20 years. And I would say sort of, you know, the job is all encompassing, jack of all trades. But I think of the things you mentioned, um, my sort of favorite aspect of my job is liaison with artists and clients and just helping people find the right pieces or the right locations for the work to be going to and really creating sort of that experience for someone not just finding a work to put on their wall but something that they really relate to and speaks to them that brings them that for quite a time to come that's sort of i would say my prime aspect that i enjoy the most personally so thank you sure thank you um mary early is uh the director of Hemkill, a Washington DC art gallery founded in 1993 with an expertise in exp exhibition planning, curatorial services, and art collection management. She works closely with artists, artist estates, and collectors to develop long range exhibition and collection management plans and to place individual works and collections with museum institutions and private collectors. Her sculpture and installation work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, and she is represented in collections of the US Department of State, Art and Embassies, the American University Museum, Corcoran Gallery of Art, and the District of Columbia Art Bank among public and private collections. She serves on the boards of Hamiltonian Artists and uh, Washington Sculptors Group. Mary, can you uh, tell us a little bit about Hemp Hill? Um, of course. Thank you, Eric. Um, and thanks everyone for being here this evening. Um, I, I 
can give you some background on myself and the history of the gallery, which Eric mentioned was founded in 1993. And along with Addison Ripley and a very tiny handful of others is uh, one of few Washington galleries nearing the 30 year mark. Um, I have been with the gallery since 1998, and when I joined, the exhibition roster was a range of artists working all media, including painters, mixed media, works on paper, photography, sculpture. Um, in those years, photography was a large component of what we handled, and sculpture, um, interestingly enough, has always been a smaller category. Um, nevertheless, we do have opportunities to place sculpture in alternative settings. Um, sometimes that is in an alternative exhibition space, uh, a temporary project, or in a public or semi-public space in a corporate environment. Uh, my work with the gallery, very much like Romy described hers, is a little bit of everything. Um, Many of the galleries you will interact with in the Washington DC area and and beyond are essentially small businesses and it is important to note that typically they are operated by maybe a, a sole proprietor or owner uh, president and then typically in our region a small staff of you know anywhere from one or two to maybe three or four people at most. Um, that means that everybody has to be capable of doing anything and everything that's required to run the gallery. And that spans everything in every category of doing business, whether um, liaising with shippers or interacting with museum curators or high profile collectors. Um, so my, my career with Hemphill has put me in the context of uh, all manner of collector types from the emerging collector uh, to established collectors to people who are collecting for investment potential, um, also extending to working with other people in professional fields such as architecture, interior design, um, art consultants, which is a topic that I think we'll discuss at some point during this evening's talk. Um, the focus of the gallery is not limited to one medium or one style of work. Uh, instead, we are committed to exhibiting and promoting works of art that have great intensity and potential and ability to impact people. Um, I'm often asked what style of work does the gallery show and I do not have an answer for that. Um, the answer could be distilled down to we show work with integrity, we show work with intensity, we show work by artists who are fully committed and fully invested in their work. Um, in complement to that, we make a full investment in their work too. Um, the relationship between artist and gallery is as important as the relationship between collector and gallery. And we work very hard to make sure that our artists are recognized as the key for the gallery. Um, it is their work that propels us forward and equally it is the patronage of collectors and the feedback and support from museums and collecting institutions that makes this all possible. Um, there is often a reluctance to talk about the market of the art world. There is actually a market. If there wasn't one, none of us would be talking about this. Um, the market is complicated. I hope that will shed some light on the subject this evening. Um, so I look forward to your questions. For me, Mary, one of the things that came up in our conversations was the reducing in the use of the word gallery. Mm -hmm. And I think what we, we and so I, I sort of tried to be, I don't know what the correct way to do it would be, so I said commercial art spaces. Yeah. Is that a gallery sort of makes suggest that the exhibition is, the exhibition and sales from exhibitions are the bulk of the business of a gallery, mm -hmm. and that the bulk of the sales from the galleries are through the exhibitions and through the stable, through the through the, body, the all of the artists that the uh, that the commercial art space represents, is has that changed? Yeah. So let me address the first point you made about like the the use of the word gallery. Um, in in Hemphill's history, the the business opened in 1993 
as Hemphill Fine Arts. And the term Hemphill Fine Arts was meant to encompass all the art forms. So as to distinguish this business, this gallery, as being a destination you could go to to fulfill all your interests, photography, sculpture, painting, not limited. Um, eventually, for branding reasons, we left the fine arts off because we had established a national reputation and were able to do so. Um, I think that, you know, part of it is, is just branding and identity. Um, it is visually a graphic that is very strong. So we wanted to use just the business name as a, a demonstration of, of um, longevity and steadfastness. Um, the use of the word gallery is always in conversation. So the, the building itself is the gallery space. Without the gallery space, no exhibition will exist. So you'll always hear me use the word gallery but it's not like an exhibition hall or an arcade where you're going to be sort of bombarded by all kinds of different things. We work very hard to create focused exhibitions mm -hmm. and create an exhibition schedule that nourishes our audience. Um, we have been challenged by that in the last seven months, as you can imagine, exhibitions no longer occupy the same time and space and public arena as they did once. So we have adjusted after a six month sort of almost a hiatus while we had one exhibition in place for almost uh, March through August, we will launch in October a series of rolling exhibitions, which will be presented online for an audience that can view the exhibitions from home and consume the related exhibition media and presented simultaneously in the gallery, but in a different sort of schedule than the typical seasonal exhibition schedule where one show closes and the other one opens. We will actually run two shows simultaneously and they'll be staggered and that will capitalize on the visits that people make to the gallery. Meaning, Joan, if you are limiting your exposure to public activities and you're willing to make an appointment to come downtown to visit the gallery, you will see two shows instead of one and you may, you know, that may benefit you because you'll be exposed to two different artists' work or two thematic statements at the same time. So we're hoping that this is something that will prove successful um, because we just have a totally new audience right now and a new way of interacting with the audience. I guess one part of the question for me included, and I really appreciate that because learning how, I, I just went to the, by the way, the um, Sculpture Now with a time ticket. So mm -hmm. you physically went into a space that has a gorgeous show up and it's the it's over at the McLean Project for the Arts. So you can it's possible to do that and get and and see physically see work. But in the conversations, whether it was Romy or you had talked about, and which surprised me, and that's why I raised the question that way, that the that the sales through the business of of the sales, and I'll ask Romy this maybe the sales through other than the stable of artists that or the exhibition schedule surprised me that that the a lot of the a lot of the revenue for your business is from other sources that really surprised me so i don't really i don't sure um, oh, go ahead Romy. sorry oh no i was just going to say as far as the exhib exhibitions themselves go i always tell artists and i think our collectors this as well even though and let's use the old model because as mary said things are sort of changing and i think we're all trying to figure out how this works moving forward but let's say our exhibition schedule was every five weeks we had a new show in my mind most of our exhibits really started at least a month in advance with promotions collectors who knew that artists already starting to want to see what was coming up and it really extends for a good six months after a show comes down because inevitably people remember the show or they've missed it. I don't, I don't like to use that sort of like five week model as just mm. the exhibit. In my mind, it's really a far 
greater period, it might just not be entirely on our walls at that time. Um, but I would say that, yes, every show is different. Sometimes um, the majority of our sales in that short period may come from the exhibit, yeah. but we're always continually working on so many projects and whether it's helping with a collection or just someone who comes in looking for a piece, but what may be hanging may be abstract and they like landscape or representational or they're looking for a photograph or a sculpture. So while what we have up may be what may bring someone in off the street or particularly to see that work, there are so many other activities and avenues being explored sort of behind the scenes that I think people don't often see because, you know, that's not what we're working on out front. That's not what they see through the window. What, um, would, what would those be, Romy? What kinds of examples, like for art advisors? Or I would, working just with someone trying to find a piece for their home or office collections or continuing to help clients find um, works that are appropriate for their collections or facilitating auction purchases, mm -hmm. um, you know, or curating spaces that are outside of the gallery that may be a rotating space um, that I think we all sort of work on as well. So there, just as there are many hats, as Mary said at the beginning, that we sort of run a gamut of things we're doing, um, I think that's also true for the way sales flow in the gallery. and. To that extent, the sales might not just be the artists that we <coughs> present. If um, someone's looking for something and I don't have that, I still want to help them find it. I, we work with other galleries, print houses, artists that may not currently have representation. Um, I think we all want to use all of the resources at our disposal, not necessarily, in addition to, I should say, mm -hmm. the artists that we represent. Mary, do, do, can you talk some more about that as well? About uh, the diversity of... Uh, yeah, about, about the diversity. I don't know whether yours, your list would be a little different or, or would it be more the same? Um, you know, some of, some of our business practices mirror what Romy is describing. Um, I, I would say that we do we handle the work of living artists. We handle the work of a handful of artists' estates. We handle sales of work on the secondary market. Um, I think for this audience, which is almost exclusively practicing artists, um, that is important to educate yourself about, that there is a substantial secondary sales market for artwork that, um, consumes the energy and inventory of dealers uh, at, at every level. Um, it, it, you know, if you're looking for percentage of sales, I, I would give kind of a loose guess that our sales of living artists work are one percentage of our, our sales and then sales of secondary market works, meaning reselling something from a private collector a second or third or even a fourth time. Um, you know, they're balanced in terms of number of items. It's fewer secondary market items to many more works by living artists, but the finances are such that the dollar amount of sales on the secondary market far exceeds that of the living artist market. Um, that is not to say that the profit or the income potential varies that dramatically. Um, they are two very different areas. Um, Romy mentioned the lead in to working on a show, which it may mean promoting the artist's work for the show a month or two months in advance. Um, we generally are working on the potential sales for an artist's exhibition many months, if not a year in advance. We are constantly interacting with collectors to maintain their interest, uh, to send them works of interest or new works from the artist's studio in advance of an exhibition so that they know that we are nurturing their interests as well as um, presenting and supporting the artist. Um, think about being a practicing artist who has an exhibition every two to three years. 
Now, if all your sales happened every three years and then nothing for the two years in between, you would have a financial mess on your hands. Um, so it is important to look at the balancing out of the production of work and the sales activities so that during those in-between periods where you don't have an exhibition with your gallery, um, what is going to create your income from your work? Um, you know, some artists are lucky to be able to budget it out and make it work. Um, others are in dire straits between shows. Um, and and that is, that's something that you can talk to your gallery and look at what your production methods are like, look at what the exhibition schedule is going to be for your work. Once you have a show, when is the next one? How long will it take you to produce the work for the next show? Will work be available for sale, you know, a few months after your first show closes? Um, those are all worthwhile questions to ask yourself. Um, you know, I'm going to skip ahead because there are some questions about, you know, how we work with artists. Really, I have to say that the dealer artist relationship is a partnership and it should always be looked at as such. Um, and as an artist, you need to look out for your interests as well as learn what the environment that you're coming into is. Um, there are some standard practices in galleries, but a lot of galleries fly by the seat of their pants and have handshake contracts or no contract. Um, so it is always worthwhile to discuss the terms um, before you enter into a relationship and really talk about, talk about what's going to happen once a gallery begins to represent you and sell your work. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just going to stop you for a second because we do have that question about coming uh, about contracts and whether what a contract might look like and what it should include. Um, and so I would like to get there, but I had, I had my, but I, what I, those questions I was asking about was to be encouraging to say that even, because one of the questions we'd asked, and I don't know if we have time for it in terms of the general business questions, how do you add new people to your stable? And one of the, one of the, responses is it's not always necessary to add someone to your stable. And then we will get to the contract question, but I just wanted to drive home this point. I think what Romy had said, I don't, I'm not seeing her image right now, um, that, that she is very, she actively looks, and maybe you can share this, actively looks at people's work and even unsolicitedly, I mean, if, it, if it's submitted, because she wants to know what's out there because she works and, and, Romy, maybe you should be answering this with the other advisors and consultants. I thought that was a very useful and a very positive uh, way of saying that we, we know that to some extent sculpture can be difficult. We'll talk about that in terms of gallery, gallery work. But, I think there is, but it's, not, it's not an unhappy situation because you have opportunities in terms of other outlets and other mechanisms to, to bring that work in. And I want to share sure. that before we get on to the contract. Ab stuff. Absolutely. I mean, we do have the artists that we represent and that we work with. And as Mary said, we're sort of always working to continue those relationships and to have work available. But for some projects or some clients, um, we may need additional pieces or work by an artist that just isn't something we have in the gallery. Um, and so I'm always happy to look at other pieces. I want to know what's going on out there because something may not be work that for an exhibit with us, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work for a client or for a collection we're putting together um, that may be, you know, several spaces available or other curatorial um, opportunities outside of the gallery. So I just think it's important for us, I think, um, to know what's going on in our arts community in all areas, um, especially if it's just something we don't have or I'm looking for. I always want to know what's out there. It, it may not work for us in the moment, but there's just always, you know, some things that stick with you and come to you and that they're right for a project or for a presentation um, that's being pulled together. So I, I do think it's important, even if the 
gallery might not be taking on new artists um, for their roster at that time to still introduce, you know, introduce yourself, approach them, be available. Um, I would say that, and I don't mean to sound trait, my answer when people ask if we're looking for new artists might be, we're not looking for new artists in the moment, but I always want to take a look. And, and that is true. I, I never want to miss out on something that mm -hmm. is exciting and wonderful and might not work in the moment, but will stay with me. Right. So you are open to that and you do take advantage of... Uh... We, we are open to that. Um, I would say reaching out, introducing yourself, visiting the galleries, mm -hmm. um, making an appointment. <laughs> I will say just sort of popping in with a portfolio sometimes is difficult because we're so busy juggling other things and not that we don't want to share that time with people. Sometimes it's just can't be done in the moment. In the last section, we'll be, we'll be, okay. we'll be talking to, no, I have this perfect, but we'll Definitely. be talking to, you know how Mary's a lot of sort of doing about that. About what, Thank you. A lot of questions about what's the, what's the etiquette for the right on. Yeah, I'll just answer now. Um, I, I have a similar response. You know, my gallery is not adding new artists, especially not right now, because we are committed to a small number of artists who rely on us for their livelihood. Um, so for us to introduce a new artist to the gallery right now would actually take sales away from other artists and take our time and split it among more people. So the question is always, are you looking at artists? Or sometimes the question is, how do I get my work shown in your gallery? That is a very difficult question to answer and, and can be uncomfortable. Um, so I am usually in a position where I have to tell people we are not looking at new artists' work, but that I would be happy to take a look at their work because I want to know what is going on in our community, just like Romy indicated. Um, I may have a suggestion for you of another venue or resource for your work. I may, a year from now, have a consulting project for which your work is appropriate. Um, but there are fewer spots in galleries than there are artists. Um, there are hundreds of artists seeking rep rec uh, representation and the number of galleries is shrinking mm -hmm. month by month by month. So I always encourage artists to do their research before they approach a gallery because if you're asking them to invest the time to review your work and perhaps give you critical feedback, uh, you should be prepared and have done your your background work on them too. Terrific. Thank you. I, I agree with that a hundred percent. Um we sometimes receive images from work and I'm often I just there should be you should familiarize yourself with the galleries that you want to approach. I think that as Mary said, sort of do your homework. Um I I just think that's important also to sort of know where you're, what you're looking at. If, for example, if you are a portrait painter, but the, or just as an example, but the artist does not show any portrait work or figurative work, that will probably not be an appropriate match. So sometimes I just think um, taking the background work also so that when we do get into it and if we do pursue something additionally, that there is already some sort of connection. Thank you. Great. Uh, Joan, I wanted to quickly chime in with a question that came in the chat. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. I am adding them to the list. Um, this one goes out to Mary. Um, it's from Claudia. Uh, Claudia Vest asked, uh, Mary, you mentioned working with artist estate planning. Could you say more about this? Do you recommend pursuing a trust or foundation for the artwork? Great question. Um, the answer is going to be different for every artist. Um, the first step in protecting your legacy for when you are no longer here is to keep your family members, your heirs, or in absence of family members, a close friend informed about what your vision is for your work. Um, if you have an established market, if you have a track record of sales, if you have works that are in museum or institutional collections during your lifetime, then you're a good candidate for some kind of organized planning effort to 
create a trust or foundation or organizational entity to continue to sell and place your work after your death. Um, it can require a big commitment on the part of family members to carry out an artist's wishes. So it's very important to communicate that to your family. The best thing you can do is to begin organizing your work now, even if now is as a emerging 35 year old artist. Um, it is never too early to start. And the best planning for your legacy is to have a successful and well-rounded career. Um, the most difficult questions I deal with are from families who have inherited a collection of work where the artist was never recognized or exhibited during their lifetime. And so their task is monumental. They are looking to um, find safe places for the work out in the museum world and in private collections, but there's no base of research or scholarship or anything on the artist. In some cases, there's a little magic where somebody is undiscovered and then discovered, but that is sort of a Hollywood picture of art, <laughs> art estate success. So my advice is really talk with your loved ones um, or with an attorney. Um, if you if you create a, a trust or a foundation which will protect your work and give it to institutions or sell it through galleries, that's great. Um, realize that the work of protecting your, your future legacy begins during your lifetime. It should not be handed off to your heirs mm -hmm. because it is such a monumental task. If you start a practice now for photographing, documenting, keeping notes as well as you can about works or placements that will also go a long way down the road to help your heirs or whoever is trying to help organize and get those things going especially now it's so easy we're not relying on slides anymore um but that sort of documentation starting early will help um in the long run as well and again, that type of documentation means creating a way to track your artwork that you create, your artwork that you exhibit. And in most cases, you should create a database or Excel spreadsheet or a recipe box or anything to keep yeah. track of your work. Which, which so, leads, which leads me to one question. I'm, I'm going to cut this a little bit. There is a Robin Moore program on the website yeah. about yeah. estate planning. And we have, we're, we're trying to sort of cover an awful lot of territory. Um, and one of the things that, uh, and I just totally blanked on my question, I'm sorry, <laughs> Drew. It's hard, hard to try to keep track of time on this. Um, but to answer Claudia's question, uh, Claudia has one last question, trust versus foundation. It really depends on the finances. So if you have money to give away, I think you should create a foundation. If you want to hold the artwork in trust to protect your heirs from a, a big tax bill, maybe a trust, but th those are legal questions that I, I am not the best advisor on. So maybe we should go, go to the question about um, okay. misconceptions that, that, um, that people have of the gallery uh, and uh, sort of a larger question, things that, that, that sort of people misunderstand when dealing with gallerists and their, and, and their uh, their their roles in the art community. Um, Romney, do you want to go and try try taking that? Um, sure. I I think we've touched on a few of the misconceptions about galleries. I think one of the biggest, um, sort of being that we only sell or are working with what you might see on the walls. Um, I think sometimes people who don't frequent a lot of galleries or maybe haven't purchase work before, that's sort of something um, that they may think when they come in, oh, is this all you have or all, you know, all you show. Um, I think that's a, mis a big misconception. And I think also for artists, conversely as well, if we, we do show some sculpture, we are mostly a two-dimensional artist, but that shouldn't stop them from 
from asking or bringing their work in, we do, you know, we are multimedia. So I think sort of the first misconception is just getting past what's on the wall in that moment, um, that we all do so many other things. I think another misconception is um, that artists are sort of giving galleries a percentage just to sort of rent that space for that time. Um, but I think Mary has sort of also alluded to this. We're doing things behind the scenes all the time to help promote our artists or to try to place their work that's not just necessarily confined to that, you know, six week period. Um, I think that that is another sort of misconception that people have and that we're only sort of working with us and the client. Um, there's a lot of other people sort of interacting with us in at play that Mary sort of mentioned before. Also, interior designers, curators, architects, mm -hmm. art consultants. Um, there are a lot of people bringing art to us and sort of out into the world as well. It's 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 a team effort sometimes um, to sort of make those projects happen, and I think that sometimes that's um, not fully out there in the world um, that people aren't really aware of. Does it ever make sense for artists to connect directly with these art advisors or curators and show them their work now that the, the numbers, of of numbers of galleries have gone down? Absolutely, yes. Art advisors and art consultants are doing more business now than ever before. Traditionally, art consultants were in the domain of corporate art projects, but that is no more. Um, high net worth individuals, busy people, they want someone to give them advice. And retaining the services of an art advisor can actually be affordable. Um, in that the person serves to work for you as an advisor and educator. They research prices. They negotiate with galleries and present artwork to the collector. Um, art advisors tend to mostly be working for the client, but in order to work effectively for the client, they need to cultivate relationships with both galleries and with individual artists. In Washington, there are a lot of artists without gallery representation. So there is a lot of material for art advisors to access. Mm -hmm. um, you can start counting galleries on, you'll quickly <laughs> fill up one hand and probably stop counting galleries soon after. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that Washington is a hot spot for art advisor. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I work with a lot of them. I know Romy does too. We both also serve as art advisor to many clients. So in some cases, I'm the art advisor. In other cases, I am providing resources to the art advisor. Um, so it is worthwhile to educate yourself about who those individuals are and if they have a policy of reviewing art, artworks and artists. There are a couple um, organizations. One is Art Registry, which was founded over 10 years ago by um, uh, Aaron Chase McKay, who at one time was with WPA in Washington. And now the DC Office of Art Registry is operated by a former colleague of mine. And they are, they position themselves as a, a sort of start, like a, the, the name says it all, Art Registry. They are a, a place that collates artists into, you know, a, 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 like a website and a roster, but without having a gallery system. So that is one model. Um, so I, I find that art advisors account for a big enough percentage of our sales of artists across all spectrums that it's an important market to be paid attention to. I will say that I have actually sort of in a reverse way, I was looking for something specific for a client and had made some presentations and was just sort of at the end of my resources. And I actually reached out to a couple art advisors we work with mm -hmm. and was like, hey, can you help? This is what I'm looking for. And they were able to sort of help guide me in a direction for some artists I was unaware of. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, a wonderful resource all around, to be honest. No, that was a, that was it reminds me to tell you that there are professional relationships at play here. So if Romy is interested in one of Hemphill's gallery artists, 
she will inquire with me as the buyer uh, or dealer and I'll give her information about available work and I will also give her net pricing. So we have an agreement that for any of our gallery artists, we extend what we call a trade or professional discount, meaning she can sell an artwork by my artist to her client and she will be able to retain a commission on the sale. That means that we reduce our commission that way they can be compensated for the sale without having to charge the buyer more than the retail price. Exactly. Um, does, the art, does the artist contribute to that split in any way? This is- Depends on the contract. So right. I have That's artists it. who allow splitting a discount and I have some artists who cannot afford to do it and limit it at a certain percentage. Okay. So it depends on the artist and it depends on their contract with the gallery, but it's mm -hmm. pretty standard for um, for dealers to offer each other a 20% commission on an artist whose work they exclusively represent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that includes art consultants. So um, in some cases, art consultants are presenting their client with the net price and then they add a percentage commission. In other cases, they're presenting them with the retail price and then they retain a commission. It, it can be split up many different ways. If the pie is, gets divided in many different ways. I just I think when touching on that, it's important to remember, um, I encourage our artists to maintain a price point and that is the price and that price should not fluctuate based on what those percentages are or what you're willing to work with at your gallery. Those are conversations you should have at the beginning yeah. or exactly. ask if you haven't had already. Um, there have been rare situations where the, the project we're working on is such so great for the artist, but the budget is only X. I may have to go back and say, hey, for this one time, can we be, you know, work with us or whatever? But there they are conversations that the general principle should be had up front, but the prices should stay the same. Um, I know somebody sort of asked that in previous questions about different venues, different pricing for us. I can't speak emphatically enough. There should be one price. Yeah. Um, that is bad. If, especially now with the internet and access that everyone has, if someone's looking for an artwork and they see price A, price B, price C, it creates a lot of problems. There should be one price. Mm -hmm. There was a question that came in in advance that was, how does someone price a piece when different venues charge different percentages? And I actually was prepared for this question. <laughs> and, and because it is very important, um, you must determine your retail price and create a price structure for your work that you reevaluate periodically. That might be every 12 months, every 24 months, every five years. Um, determine your price as if you will be giving the gallery or seller a 50% commission. Now that may vary, perhaps you'll show somewhere where they take a 40% commission, that's great. Your retail price should be consistent. Um, if you sell work in your studio while simultaneously having representation by a commercial gallery, the prices you quote in your studio should be consistent with the prices that a gallery is quoting. Um, the worst comment I will ever hear from a collector who is considering an artwork is when they say, I think I'll go to the artist directly and get a better price. And I just want to smack my head because we represent the artist. We work together on the price. Um, do they not respect the work that the gallery does to earn their commission or to fortify the artist's price structure? We actually work together on this. Um, so I know it happens that artists get manhandled by collectors who want to deal or want to price, but if you can stand up to those prodding, you know, requests for a special price or a, this or that, you will be helping yourself fortify your price structure for the future. And Mary, I'm going to, I, I want to come back and I, because all of this leads to should an artist always have a contract with a gallery in order to know what's expected from both sides and to document what happens in the event of sales, commissions? I, 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 he didn't, they, this question didn't mention multiple parties in the, in the, in the deal, theft, mm -hmm. damage to the work, shows in other galleries, 
um, how, how, what are, what are, what kinds of, what are the, the spe how specific do the contacts get? And do they spell out a lot of these alternative possibilities? That's Yes, the contracts can get very specific and can spell all of that out. I have about an eight page contract for artists that starts with what the gallery's obligations to the artist is. It describes when they're first, if they're a new artist, it, it states in the number of months or years when their first or next show will be and how quickly the subsequent show will be. It describes how the gallery will represent the artist on their website and with physical inventory. It mm -hmm. describes the procedure for receiving artwork on consignment and providing inventory records. It spells out the establishment of a retail price structure that the artist and gallery will review at, at mm -hmm. like two year intervals. And it also says we will split sales 50-50 and if there is an allowance for a shared discount, that is also spelled out. In the absence of a contract, like an extensive written contract, if you are providing work inventory to a gallery for resale, then the simple consignment form is your contract. And that consignment form should list the artwork, its, re its prices, and then list what percentage discount is mm -hmm. provided. Um, and, and for an artist who is not represented by the gallery they're engaged in sales with, it's totally appropriate for it to be less of a commission. Um, I have worked with artists who I, have, I don't have the ability to offer them representation or an exhibition, and therefore we, we agree to maybe a 30% commission or 40%, but in recognition of what that 50-50 split brings you if you're represented, it's, it's something that you can negotiate on. And things like framing or post, being used to the postcard, framing or advertising? The case-by-case -case basis, okay. exactly. And that, has, that can be and has to be written in written into the yeah, yeah. and I feel I feel that framing is best the responsibility of the artist because they will end up with the framing if the work is unsold. Right. Um, but sometimes an artist may not have the resources to pay, you know, a big framing bill. We might pay it and then be reimbursed when things sell, or if years go by. It just ends up being a loss, and, and it just washes out. And people, I think, need to know so they're not surprised if they if they ultimately would need to reimburse for the framing if that's yeah. Works. Definitely. I, I want to chime in with another audience question. Thank you, audience. Um, from Cheryl Edwards, talking about markets here. I have found that the collector base in D.C. for African American artists, other than the secondary market, is very small. Can both of you shed some light on the issue? Um, I, I think that that is true, but changing. Um, I, I, w I would agree that the secondary market um, for African American artists is um, unfortunately sort of a larger market. I think just, um, I think, I mean, Sam Gilliam is a sort of a prime example right now of works like that. He's receiving a lot of recognition um, later in his career. But um, I think that that is changing. And Mary, do you? Yeah, I, I, it's a great question, Cheryl. It's one that should be asked all the time. <laughs> and you are very correct in pointing out that the collector base and the appetite for secondary, mar secondary market work by historic more modern than contemporary of the moment artists has been. And I do think that is changing. Um, the spotlight has been put on black artists mm -hmm. and that demands change from dealers who have been accustomed to showing overwhelmingly white or white male artists for many decades. Um, the community of black artists in Washington is monumental and very powerful and one of the disconnects is the number of black dealers, which is very small um, in comparison. And when we see both of those things change, we will see something real change. What I have found is that handling the significant works on the secondary market has led into relationships with um, both new artists and new collectors that is propelling everything up. So. 
as you may know, one of my specialties is the work of Alma Thomas. Um, and that, that, ex that interest, that looking deeply into her work has actually opened up my access to other artists' work. And so it is, I am frustrated that there is not a greater, stronger, more powerful market for um, African-American artists in Washington. And part of, the, part of the challenge is, one, the number of galleries in general, um, and then the, the challenge for a young dealer to open up a space in a, such a competitive environment. So I wanna see that change. Um, if you want numbers, and I know data sometimes helps, sometimes doesn't, out of a group of say nine core artists, only three of them that we represent are non-white. And so I don't think that that is representative enough. So um, we are seeking to change that and it comes with the addition of a new artist to the roster. So it takes time, but I'll say too much time. The time should be now. And so we need to know who is not being seen working in our community in order to begin to change that. Right on. And Mary, can you clarify when you mean secondary market? One more time. Yeah, um, meaning an artwork that is being sold not directly from the artist, but perhaps from a collector who has owned the work. Um, when a work is sold at auction, that is considered a secondary market. Um, most, uh, say, works that are resales. So if, if, if Joan purchased a work by um, Jacob Lawrence 30 years ago, and she comes to me and decides to sell it, I will take it on consignment, we agree to a price, and I begin to offer it to my collectors who are interested in Jacob Lawrence. That is considered a secondary market sale. Well, I would, I'd like to add also just that what you had said from the very, very beginning is that a very large part of your sale, in general, of, of all artists, is secondary market sales. That so it's, is, not, it's not an extraordinary, it's not an exceptional necessarily or an extraordinary thing that that there's such a disproportionate connection between the emerging people working with contemporary work um, and and or the secondary market, the value of the secondary market. It's, I mean, it strikes me that 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 is true of all all art at this point, probably. That there are many I, think, I think that that breakdown has become more and more common in, yeah. in galleries across the yeah. country and also internationally. And one of the reasons is certain works on the secondary market can achieve much higher prices and potentially higher profit. And those profits help us operate the gallery in order to host exhibitions and activities related to sustaining our living artists' work. So it's not a case of the secondary market sales taking away from the sales of living working artists. It's actually that provides cash flow at a higher degree that helps keep and the question had come up in the program running. And the question had come up in the context of African American work and the secondary market or epic. And it, it's true, I think, of all work too. That um, that there's a that, that as you said the emphasis and the value of the secondary market supports the the, the living artist work yeah. um, across the board. You had asked earlier what are some misconceptions, mm -hmm. and and this conversation topic leads me to that. You may you may see that a gallery is showing historic work by certain artist and think, oh, they're not interested in contemporary work. Yes, we absolutely are. Um, the historic work gives context to the work of this time. Um, I, I count myself lucky to be in, involved with these historic objects. You know, sometimes abstract expressionist paintings from the 1950s that were created in a volatile 
social and civil and political environment that have timeliness and impact today. So um, we are, I, I think everybody in this field is in it for love of art, not for love of money. Um, so never think that money is the, the driving motivation. Well, I have, we, we're sort of out of time. We're sort of, we're actually beyond time, but I want to ask Romy, are there any questions we should have asked that we didn't? Um, well, I see a couple that came into the chat that I just sort of want to um, jump into, although I think we touched on them a little bit, but they sort of go hand in hand. Um, one sort of being our galleries just sticking with the artists they have right now or are they looking for new artists um and the other also being again sort of the conversation about adding um people of different people of color different backgrounds from different areas and different countries to our roster um i i think that goes hand in hand we are looking but we sort of also have a set schedule. We're trying to sort of get back into that mode. So we are looking, and I think something that Mary also touched on briefly that's important is the sort of white male cat. We really worked hard to expand to women. Like that's sort of a rolling conversation that includes all things to be encompassing the artists and to bringing new artists in and to always acting um, with intention to be inclusive. Um, so I think those are sort of two questions that go hand in hand. We are focusing sort of right now um, on the artists that we work with, um, that we have, as Mary also said, but also looking for opportunities to increase um, that sort of exposure and inclusion within the gallery. Thank you. Thank you both. There's just so much we did not cover, um, including the do's and don'ts. <laughs> so what we're, we're going to invite you to the after, after party, um, after Annie tells us a little bit about what's coming up in the Sculptors Group. And then you can ask, do I send you an email or do I send you uh, a, a letter? What's the, or do I walk in the door um, and, and ask the questions of, of some of those do's and don'ts? Romy and Mary, thank you enormously. Thank you for um, having me. And thank you so much. So, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to Asma and, and Annie, yeah. I guess. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, we're gonna get Annie to share those slides for you because there's a lot of good notes, a lot of great things happening. Once again, thank you both to our panelists. Tons of questions that came in, this is amazing. I mean, we had 30 to 40 questions before the session um, and from all over internationally and then the questions that came in. So if we did not get an answer, we'll send them forward to the panelists and they'll you know, either answer them in the after party or even uh, via email. So we're gonna also give you their contact information, right? Okay, so hope, hopefully you enjoyed all these great discussions and conversations we've been having through the professional skills development um, series. Uh, Joan and Eric have been doing wonderfully with these sessions and they're gonna take a break. Uh, you can call it just a, a long holiday sort of uh, sabbatical, if you will. And so we're gonna continue up the programming in 2021. Uh, which we look forward to. And then, of course, we want to talk uh, once again about those member benefits. So important. Make sure to take a screen capture or, you know, a, a photo of that screen right there. All these great opportunities, of course. And uh, do stick around because our wonderful chairperson, Annie Farrar, is going to talk about our upcoming events. Go ahead, Annie. Hello, thank you so much for, um, and I just want to put this on the screen for a minute if anyone wants to take a screenshot. Um, while I start talking about, we have, um, once again, I'm always plugging our membership because we have amazing members and opportunities and we are a volunteer only organization. So we cannot do any of this without your support. So thank you so much for joining us. And if you're not already a member, please consider joining. Uh, and if you are a member, thank you so much. We appreciate you. And um, we have a lot of upcoming events still. So we're having a little pause in this program, but we still have, um, we've been having monthly happy hour member forums that are a lot of fun. I know some of you are attending them on a regular basis. So I look forward to hopefully seeing you again in October. Um, and right now we actually have two live exhibitions, which you can go see in person, both of them, or online. Um, 
So uh, out at Artina, I definitely recommend going and seeing our um, show at Sandy Spring. Uh, there are socially distanced artist talks most Fridays at 4.30 p.m. So if you're on Facebook, check us out then. Give our artists a shout out. And the ones that have happened are up on, video recordings are up. Uh, and there's also food trucks on Fridays. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, Sculpture Now opened this past weekend. And I know uh, we have a lot of artists from both shows in, in this group today. So thank you. And that can be viewed as a full online program at McLean Project for the Arts website and reservations in advance for in-person and I went out on Saturday and I highly recommend seeing it. It's a beautiful exhibition. Um, and so there will be, it uh, looks like we also have a virtual artist talk coming up on October 22nd from 7 to 9 for that. So mark your date and try to get to see the show. And I always like to plug our annual dinner we're going to have to mix it up a little this year. You know, I usually we get to go to someone's beautiful house or, or a gallery or something like that, but it's going to have to be on Zoom. But we are going to try to do a recipe exchange. And we can't do potluck, so, um, and we are open for other ideas of how to make it fun, but please come. This is where you get to vote, vote for the board and do all kinds of things like that. So do a recap of all the great things we've had this year. So I just want to say thank you for being so supportive of the organization. And I think this has been a really, I think getting to work with all of you is part of what's making, um, <laughs> making COVID uh, tolerable. So thank you all for every, for being here. And I'm going to think that's all on my uh, script. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna stop sharing so we can all chat if we want. And thank you so much for to Mary and Romy's. Really appreciated hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.